A man trying to understand himself has tried to orient his own place in the larger pattern of universal activity. This has perhaps led to a kind of escape mechanism which we do observe also in the pages of history. One of the best ways to get our minds off of the small and immediate business of self-improvement is to become absorbed in some cosmic scheme. It is so easy for us to enjoy a kind of intellectual gymnastics in which the mind becomes greatly intrigued with its own findings and keeps on exploring perhaps not the facts of things but its own capacities in application to world knowledge. We do, however, find that there are certain archetypal thoughts that we cannot actually trace to any one source. They seem to have descended to us perhaps at first in very simple form from the first imaginings, the first speculations, the first intuitions of primitive mankind, always confronted by and surrounded by the unknown. Man has tried to conquer it in every way that he could. On the physical plane of things, he has achieved considerable. But in the abstract realms, mystery has still conquered him. This evening, we want to summarize in some simple pattern uh, those kingdoms of nature which seem to share with us the habitation of this planet. Looking out from the centers of awareness in our own natures, we are aware of a world. We are aware that this world is full of living things, that these living things are by nature and substance magnificent. Some of them are antipathetical to ourselves. We have to struggle against them. Primitive man against the great beasts of the world in which he lived. Modern man against microorganisms, weed, and devil grass. But so although some things do not seem very friendly, each of the forms of life that we can study is a wonder world of its own. It is easy to understand why enthusiastic, sensitive human beings have devoted their entire lives to some one small type of growing thing. Huge books have been written about ferns and lichens. Man has never ceased to wonder at the order, the mathematical precision and yet the wonderful dramatic flair that is present everywhere in nature. He has tried to moralize upon natural things, and we have had ages of fables, like Aesop's and Fontaine's, where man invested other creatures with human attributes, not only to understand those creatures, but perhaps through their native habits to understand himself a little better as he recognized these same habits in his own life. But however we wish to approach this particular phase of the subject, we do acknowledge that this world, this earth, this little bit of land we call our own, is truly a garden of wonders, and that here we see truly an infinite unfoldment of infinite life. Even today, on the level of our hyper-intellectualism, however, we have overlooked one point, <coughs> which it seems to me is valid, and has been recognized long before our own time. <coughs> this point is that what we see 
is limited by our own sensory perceptions. We are looking out at nature, but we are not seeing all of it. This we have to generally acknowledge. We are not only limited as to how much we can see of certain things, but we are limited by the total band of our sensory perceptions. Anything that is outside of our own faculty power to discern simply does not exist. Sometimes some evidence of other things may come to our attention as occasionally a mariner at sea will discover some form of life from far below the surface that has come to the surface either in death or in some phenomenal circumstance. Actually, however, we are limited to organisms composed of materials which we can comprehend, which we can contact in some way through the sensory perceptions which we possess. Another point that I think is uh, rather valid and important is that when we are trying to understand our own sensory functions and reach the extremities or the boundaries of our sensory faculties, uh, we seem to come not to a blur but to a hard line of demarcation. It would seem as though some kind of a wall exists uh, beyond our sensory contacts. Things do not seem to drift on into the invisible. They seem to have sharp boundaries, and we pass from that which we can see very clearly, almost immediately, to that which we cannot see at all. There is no twilight zone here of things partly within our sensory perceptions and partly outside. This is true at both ends of this gamut of perceptive power. Uh, at the lower end, we pass down into the mineral kingdoms and perhaps a wee bit further. And then suddenly we are in the midst of the invisible. As we ascend, we go through the estate of man, the highest creature that we are able to actually cognize. And immediately beyond man again is the unknown. We are not able to see the trailing robes of some superior order. They remain invisible. Man, however, has developed certain extra faculties, and under some special conditions, these seem to reveal a little more than our ordinary perceptions uh, would include. But what these extrasensory perceptions seem to mostly do is to reveal a little more about the things which we already see. Perhaps, for example, we can observe the magnetic fields of bodies. We have already seen the bodies. We see just a little more of the energies which maintain them, energies which we have long assumed to exist, because even from the beginning there were these persons with extrasensory faculties which gave record or reported these things. They were not always believed in their own time, but the tradition lingers, and as we come to a more adequate knowledge in our present day, we are confirming far more of antiquity than we are disproving. But we are in a world in which, for practical purposes, we see about us four essential kingdoms, and the Paracelsians and the Greeks and some of the Asiatic peoples uh, related these kingdoms to the elements and uh, gave us the general arrangement that there are apparent to us in this world four ascending orders 
of organic structural life. Uh, the lowest of these, we sometimes question whether it is organic or not, but at least it is visible. It is an integration. It is a compound. And from this compound, we can gain certain insight because we can see it. We can touch it. We can know it by such faculties as we possess. Therefore, the lowest of our kingdoms is the mineral. And above the mineral is the plant. Above the plant, the animal. And above the animal, man. We make this differentiation not with cer without certain arbitrary consistency. Uh, there is certainly a clear distinction between minerals and plants. There are, however, forms of life that seem to act as bridges between these, such as the lichen, where we seem to see growing minerals. And the Paracelsians tell us that all the elements in the earth are growing minerals, but their growth is so slow that we are unable to notice it. But this growth is responsible for the vein-like uh, structures of minerals in the earth. Between the plant and the animal, there is also a fairly clear line of obvious demarcation. Uh, the animal has additional faculties, powers, uh, sensitivities, which we are not able to see in plants. Yet again, there are plants that seem to be developing nervous systems and organisms. We know, for instance, the flycatcher plant which not only moves, but lives upon animal or insect food. We also realize that there are other forms of plants, like the sensitive plant, capable of motion. Many different links seem to bind these worlds together also, but the realms themselves are comparatively clearly marked. Then between animal and man, there seems to be a greater kinship, and still a clear line of demarcation. Some would like to assume that man is but a highly cultivated anthropoid. If they so wish to assume, I guess there's nothing we can do about it. But there seems to be some doubt about this, that actually there is a difference, perhaps more in quality than in appearance more in psyche than in material structure. But certainly there is a clear distinction between animal and man. And in the animal world in general, we group together other orders of life, as insects and birds and fishes. We group them together, considering most of them as in some way related to the animal kingdom. Then we place over this kingdom man. Uh, we might want to say that he is part of the animal world because he is a mammal. We might, might want to say that he is merely a beast on his hind legs, and some certainly seem to support this point of view. But all in all, man seems to be a creature peculiarly possessed or obsessed by a kind of mental uh, force, a mental principle. Man is certainly the only animal uh, that actually measures the duration of its own life. Man is the only animal probably that kills for pleasure. Man is the only animal that can worry about the future or regret the past. Man is the only animal also that has to be educated because its natural instincts have failed. Thus man seems to have a uniqueness about him, and some people like to assume that the simian is a kind of link between the animal and the man, uh, even as the uh, various lichens are links between the mineral and the vegetable kingdoms. So we finally come to this point where man seems to stand upon the apex of this way of life. We don't see anything beyond man, 
And even if we think we're going to have a visitor from Mars, he turns out to look very much like us. So that uh, with the exception of certain possible overtones, we see very little beyond the human state. Visibly, our faculties seem to go no further. We are not able to actually see a form of life superior to man, except in the large, abstract, astronomical sense, in which we can see suns and planets and luminaries, which perhaps in many ways belong to a race of giants in the sky. But man has become the boundary of our faculties, because it is only with our own humanity that we judge, and we can judge only our own humanity or those degrees or steps which led directly to it, which we call the other kingdoms of nature. But when we study man, we have to move now into another dimension, because that which makes man man and separates him from the beast is not visible. We cannot reach our understanding of this part of the problem simply by following the old patterns of natural history. We have to look for something else. And it has gradually come to our realization that man must be approached as a mental pattern. That it is by his mind that we are able to discover what we can know about him. Certainly, we can understand his body by dissection. We can understand many of his physical propensities by reference to other kingdoms. But the man himself is a different kind of being. As soon as we begin to ex explore this a little further, we make an interesting discovery that all human beings are not alike. Now in this we are not referring to racial differentiations. We are referring to a kind of psychological difference. And our classical philosopher friends of long ago found it convenient, finally, to divide humanity itself into three orders, different levels or grades or subdivisions within man himself. The precedence for this is also to be found in other kingdoms of nature. There is more than one level of mineral life, more than one level of vegetable life, and certainly more than one level of animal life. Uh, we know that these differences exist in visible structure. Now we are forced to examine them in psychological structure. And in this search into the nature of man, we divide him inevitably into three types of humanity. We can say that one of these types is the human man. Another type is the animal man. And the third type is the spiritual or divine man. These all look alike, perhaps some differences, noticeable in organic quality or structure. And these differences may also be marked upon the lineaments of the face. We find that different levels of consciousness seem to shine out. But this shine is itself a rather psychological situation about which we are not too sure in terms of physical facts. But we do recognize these three types of human beings. We find one type of human being that lives and dies essentially on a level of animal existence. And what is animal existence in this case? It is a condition perfectly right and proper to animals, but not right and proper to the best in man. Uh, such animal man, if we can so differentiate him, is therefore one in whom the animal propensities predominate and dominate the life. The animal man is the individual who lives for the gratification of appetite. The animal man is the person who lives fully for the fulfillment of creature comforts. The animal man is also the hunter. He is the a prowler. He is the creature ever struggling to live. Uh, he, we like to think of man as having human attributes of a kind. When man becomes obviously cruel, we tie him to the cruelty of lower kingdoms. 
Now these kingdoms may not actually be cruel, but to us they are. We see uh, the uh, cat playing with the mouse, and to us this is cruelty. And when we see a human being playing with the life or soul or consciousness of another human being, we call this cruelty. So we observe that there is the animal man, whose expressions, motivations, and attitudes and efforts are limited almost entirely to the level of appetites. Then we distinguish the human man. The human man is the one who is making a reasonably adequate use of the essential faculties of his own humanity. In other words, the animal man is the man of appetite, uh, the human man is the man of thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness does not necessarily mean great scholarliness. Thoughtfulness is simply the use of the mind for the normal purpose of regulating the life into a constructive pattern. Uh, the human man uses his thoughts to ensure the protection of his loved ones, uh, the securities of his own values, he uses his faculties as constructively as he knows how. He has certain uh, aspirations, certain convictions. He is above the corruption of his own code. He will not do those things which cause him to degrade his own humanity. The third kind of man is the divine man. This was the hero of the ancient Greeks and of other Nordic peoples. Uh, the divine man represents uh, the highest aspiration of human endeavor, as this is exemplified in the conduct of human beings. The divine man is the great teacher, the sage, the saint, the wise man, the great creative artist, the musician. He is the person whose faculties seem to transcend the ordinary humanity of things. He seems to have skills greater than can reasonably ex be expected. But perhaps the faculties which most distinguish him are creativity and intuition. These faculties surely indicate that he has developed something beyond the creature comforts or daily needs or traditional patterns of human life. The ancients realized that there were, therefore, these uh, three kinds of persons. And from this began, they began to contemplate and did clearly differentiate three distinct patterns of mental activity. These patterns of mental activity ascended until finally they reached their highest expression in what we might term the God-man or the God-man concept. Probably we haven't uh, seen very many God-men walk upon the earth, although we are told that they did in days long gone by. But we do sense that genius, that specialization, that the infinite wisdom and compassion and insight of man can be hypothetically assumed to reach a final state of excellence in which all that is possible for man to accomplish in his humanity is accomplished by him. We then say what lies beyond this. We have carried man to the highest point we know. We have already discovered that the thing that makes him man is no longer visible. So we begin to wonder what might lie beyond him. Are there other orders of life that can truly be said to have existence? Uh, are there more kingdoms? And in mysticism and in the sacred scriptures of most peoples, the implications of other kingdoms are rather clearly noted. Uh, we hear, for example, of angelic beings, invisible but evidently assumed to exist somewhere in the mysterious depths of intangible space. Then we proceed to the archangelic hosts, a still higher, more exalted order of life, referred to by St. Paul. 
We then can go on to other orders, still more exalted, thrones, dominions, principalities, seraphim, all types of mysterious names for something that transcends our sensory perception. The philosophers came to the very simple solution that what we see of the kingdoms of nature are the visible rungs of a ladder and that these rungs continue to ascend behind the clouds which obscure our sensory perception and that all these rungs or levels together represent a great theater of evolutionary process that just as surely as we can trace growth from the least to the most of visible things, so this growth goes on and on into higher orders that we do not have the faculty to perceive. The uh, philosophic thought about this is rather clear if we wish to rationalize it, namely that what we do see cannot exist without the presence of other things we do not see. The visible cannot be suspended in a vacuum. Uh, the visible is obviously a part of something. It is as though we saw the trunk of a tree, but we cannot see the branches or the roots. Yet the trunk of the tree requires that the root be there, whether we know it or not. And the trunk of the tree also implies that the branches will also be there above, although we cannot see them. For without the root and the branch, the trunk of the tree has no purpose for its own existence. This type of thinking was used in ancient times. Now an interesting parallel speculation relating to this is to go to the lower end of our ladder and try to determine, if we can, what lies beneath the mineral levels. Uh, the moment we uh, begin to think in terms of this, uh, our physical perceptions and our mathematical skills begin to break up matter into invisible units which finally become units of energy. Thus we assume that all things physically uh, less than the mineral are to be determined by still more elementary compounds until in some hypothetical point in, in the remote distance of belowness, we come finally to the common denominator of everything, life itself. So the uh, physicist and the physical thinker uh, is simply prepared to allow uh, that the uh, mystery of growth extends uh, downward into forms that we cannot fully or truly see or which we can recognize only as parts of higher organisms until at last nothing remains uh, but a mathematical formula which can be diagrammed but which cannot directly be contemplated in its substance or its reality by any faculty that we possess even with the aid of the most powerful um, microscopes and uh, other scientific instruments. The ancients had a little different attitude about this. Uh, they contemplated the possibility uh, that these lower kingdoms actually were also uh, orders of entities, that they represented kingdoms of growing things, uh, of which the mineral was a summit for them, just as man is a summit for the visible patterns of evolution. Uh, to understand this, we must approach our problem in another way, and that is to try to determine what constitutes aliveness, what constitutes uh, the moving consciousness of things, well, as these things become less and less obvious to our sensory perception. We can take one that is comparatively simple for our present purpose and use it as a key to all the others. What about the mineral? Uh, minerals, gems, metals, and other mysterious uh, substances, uh, elements within the structure of the physical matter of Earth, what do these formations have in the term of consciousness? 
We contemplate them. We say to ourselves, they do not move. Therefore, they do not have plant consciousness as we understand it. Uh, we are not yet ready entirely to accept the Paracelsian theory that they grow, but we must come to this perhaps. Certainly, they share uh, with the plant kingdom a magnificent coloration. There are all kinds of wonderful colors hidden in the earth. They also have some kind of participation in the great geometry of existence. For many of them, particularly crystals in their fission, show regular mathematical progressions of forms. These same uh, minerals uh, do not have voice. Uh, they do not uh, have digestive systems. They do not have any of the general faculties that we know of animals. We sense no emotion and no passion in them. So we go on and we say also they are lacking the human faculties. We have no proof that minerals can think. We have no actual proof, however, of very much of anything about minerals, except their forms and their colors and such organizations of them as we may make in mineralogy for our own satisfaction. Suppose we say to ourselves now, are there other dimensions of consciousness different from our own? Man growing up through these kingdoms has been objectifying certain consciousness faculties. He has gradually built an instrument capable of maintaining human consciousness. Suppose we say to ourselves, where was this consciousness before these bodies were built? Did consciousness, as the material scientist would like to suggest, simply result from growth? And if consciousness resulted from growth, what directed growth? We must either assume that there is some law or pattern uh, superior to growth, or else growth itself becomes pretty much of an impossibility. What is the nature of this growing something that bursts through all of the kingdoms of nature? What is this life that is struggling upward uh, by this great evolutionary process? What is this power that is building ever nobler mansions for its soul? This is a good question, but not a popular one at the moment. For even after all this time, these ages of thought and speculation, we have no valid answer that can be accepted uh, by the scientifically trained person. He will not accept reason no matter how reasonable it may be. But he may have to someday, because there is no other approach to this problem unless man can break through the barriers of faculty limitation which he now possesses. Suppose we would like to say for a moment that consciousness is not only growing upward, but is moving outward or across a line between subjectivity and objectivity. That consciousness itself, in the process of moving into embodiment, moves from a certain place to a certain place, and that in this motion, consciousness itself passes through changes or modifications. The philosophers of old like to assume that there was an archetypal consciousness uh, that made up as a unit, as a total pattern of itself, the so-called seven kingdoms of nature. This archetypal consciousness was one being moving into embodiment through seven levels or steps. And that what we call evolution is the evolution of the essential consciousness of the earth itself through the various stages and levels of which both the mineral and the man are manifestations. If this consciousness per se uh, has an existence apart from body. And this, of course, is the great moot question. If this consciousness has an existence apart from body, 
then by some circumstance, purpose, will, or law. It moves into embodiment, taking upon itself a body as though by a quickening, coming into manifestation gradually through the unfoldment of its own faculties and powers, each of which, as it unfolds, provides itself with an instrument suitable for that unfoldment. Under such conditions, the mineral is the mineral state of that consciousness. The plant is the plant state of that consciousness. The animal, the animal state. Man, the human state. And beyond this, the other states of that consciousness are simply beyond the grasp of humanity, but must certainly also exist. That there must be conditions superior to man uh, seems to have been generally conceded. One of the evidences being that man can slowly, surely, and by a long and painful process become superior to himself. Therefore, there must be a superior condition into which he can move. The next situation that becomes perhaps a little interesting to us is to try to understand uh, the kingdoms of nature in reference to the planet itself. Most of the Oriental peoples and many of the classical philosophers took it for granted that the planet Earth was alive. Uh, they were not inclined to agree with the medieval theologians that it was merely a footstool shoved under man to prevent him from falling indefinitely. It seemed rather to them that the planet was a being, a living thing. And because it was alive, even though, as we suggested before, it might be considered an embryo, still not fully born, but because it is alive, it is able to support life. And because it is alive, it is also capable of unfolding the conditions of life itself. So the ancients had the tendency to assume uh, that the planet was a living organism and that this organism consisted of a series of energy fields or invisible parts of itself plus a visible part. The invisible parts were called planes and uh, these planes represented nothing more nor less than the magnetic field of the planet itself. And the ancient Tibetan mystics assumed that the planet was to be defined as seven within and seven without. The crust of the planet, its surface, therefore was the lowest of seven rings that descended to the archezoic core of the planet itself. Thus the planet had beneath its surface a kind of solar system. Uh, and this solar system became more and more uh, powerful, more and more positive as it retired from the surface down toward the center so that the highest vibration of the earth was in its center and the lowest in its circumference. Thus the surface of the earth was the outer body of the epidermis of a great living organism. The organs of this being, its various functions, being controlled by a septenary of powers within the earth itself. These, this septenary being composed of magnetic centers that correspond very closely to the planets in the orbit of a, uh, their orbits in a solar system. Uh, the seven arches of Enoch in the Bible, which led down and in the midst thereof, was the mysterious altar bearing the golden delta of Melchizedek. Uh, this, perhaps, was an ancient way of indicating the subterranean region. The initiation rites of ancient people were mostly given under the earth in caverns, and these caverns were often arranged like the Septapana cave in India, where Buddha is said to have initiated his disciples. Uh, these subterranean regions, therefore, represented the inner structure or life of the planetary lord. And in the mysterious core of this uh, planetary structure was seated as in the heart the final power of the planetary logos. 
from the surface of the earth outward, uh, there was another manifestation, this the radiant auric field, uh, which uh, uh, emanated from the uh, surface of the earth, from the planetary power within. This radiating field had its lowest level where it joined the earth's surface in its most exalted region in the circumference or outer area. And this magnetic field or aura was also stratified and had uh, symbolic colors assigned to it, but not the colors that we can see with our eyes. So just as the human body has its own magnetic centers within and its auric field enveloping it, so the planet was similarly constructed. The ancients further then declared that the, in the involutionary process consisted of the descent of uh, organized life germs, the peculiar seed carried by the planetary power in the formation of its own planet, that these seeds falling gradually through the magnetic field outside of the earth finally descended uh, to the earth itself. At the same time, from the core within the earth, another process was also moving. The earth was constantly producing from within itself the ascending orders of bodies. Uh, the earth was providing from its outer magnetic field a descending order of lives. And these lives were soon to ultimately become embodied. And the meetings of these lives and their bodies became very, very important. In the course of incarnating these seed lives created first these etheric or energy spindles as they are referred to even now in cell fission. Uh, the mineral, for example, contained the lowest form body and was associated, therefore, by the least amount of vehicle contact uh, with the entity that was to ensoul it. Thus it was that the original mineral magnetic energy moved upward, producing a series of bodies. The mineral gradually assumed the power of the plant. The plant assumed the propensities of the animal, and the animal gradually evolved into the form of man. At the same time that this procedure was taking place, entities themselves seeking embodiment were descending into union with these forms and uh, creating bridges between themselves and these forms when the form was not strong enough or evolved enough uh, to permit a full manifestation of the being. This is supposed in ancient times to be the secret of man because man is the, the lowest form of body in which there can be a true or complete union of an incarnating power with its body. Man, therefore, is the lowest of the creations of the solar system in which its own spiritual germ can be incarnated. In all lower kingdoms, uh, this germ must remain in the magnetic body fields of these creatures. It cannot enter into the body itself. The body is not able to maintain it. Therefore, in the lower kingdoms, the consciousness works upon the body. But in man, which is the lowest kingdom to be ensouled, the consciousness at quickening enters into the body and works through it. Now, this presents us with a rather interesting pattern for it begins to give us a suspicion that other kingdoms of nature are not without consciousness, but that consciousness is not tied to body as it is in the case of man. Man is the creature who has to consciously recapitulate the mineral, plant, animal, and early human stages in the process of building his own body. He must recapitulate the age patterns of these kingdoms in the processes of his own growth. 
Now, if you will uh, consider for a moment and go back to the Ptolemaic system of the solar system, you will realize that in the, that in the old geocentric system, the sun occupied the fourth orbit, the, the fourth from above and below of the seven different orbits of the ancient planetary system. The sun, therefore, became peculiarly identified with man, the luminous or the light power of the self-conscious being. The sun had to do with conscious intellect, the luminosity of self-knowing, and it was placed in the fourth uh, division of the solar system, where Pythagoras, in his monochord, a great musical structure, placed the fret which formed the octave. Therefore, the octave became the symbol of the higher and lower halves of the string. And in man, the octave represents his own self-consciousness, uh, in which the higher and lower halves of the string of his own vibratory energy uh, meet by means of the fret of individualized mind. Uh, the uh, Pythagoreans had quite a little to say and to think about this particular problem. One thing we do not know, and probably we will not know for some time with general certainty, although there may be a few who have intuited it in themselves, and that is, what is the consciousness of these living things uh, while this consciousness is not involved in body? Uh, can we say, for example, that the mineral has a conscious existence apart from body. I think we must assume that it does. We must also assume that the plant does. And we might also assume, if we so wished, that the consciousness of these lower kingdoms at this time may be greater than our own. The reason why it is greater is because it is not limited by involvement in body as ours is. The consciousness, therefore, is more in the state of the unborn being, the human being, before quickening. If we wish to assume that the consciousness of man only comes alive in the process of embodiment, as the materialist does, then we have no consciousness behind this process at all. But if we wish to assume that man coming into life is a living thing becoming embodied, then we must assume the same of the other kingdoms of nature. In relationship to our patterns, they may seem inferior. If our own consciousness could experience them, Perhaps they might be inferior in certain particulars to man. Certainly they would be inferior in the experience of mortality. They would be inferior in the power to use and administer the faculties which man has unfolded and has ensouled with his own consciousness. Here we get very, very close to our Buddhist problem again. Uh, namely, uh, what is the state of consciousness for a creature that is not involved at all in any form of matter? What is the consciousness of the individual who has never assumed any of the limitations of human consciousness? The answer would appear to be that this consciousness would be nirvanic that it would exist in an entirely different dimension from any that we know. That existing in this dimension, it may be uh, perfect, it may be infinitely enlightened in comparison to ours. That it has to have some need or reason for embodiment should also be contemplated, however. That this consciousness uh, perhaps then follows the parable of the prodigal son. For the good son who stayed at home was but slightly rewarded. For him there was no banquet, no feasting, because he was good. He was not rewarded. But the son who went forth as a prodigal, and went through the cycle of sorrow and pain, 
and finally out of a resolution of his own soul he was determined to return to his father's house and ask forgiveness for him there was a banquet and when the good son asked his father why the father answered very simply because this the prodigal son was lost and is found again uh, died and was born again so apparently the involvement of consciousness in form is part of a great universal pattern of necessity it is the great Greek spindle of necessity around which all things move and in this concept therefore the, the consciousness which has not entered into form uh, involvement must be deficient in something but at the same time it may also possess other things if it is deficient in mind it is also deficient in disobedience if it has no virtue it likewise has no vice if it uh, uh, is not capable of pleasure it can know no pain and therefore we observe the various kingdoms of nature uh, growing up according to a strange and absolute integrity which is missing in man we observe how these kingdoms are perfectly administered how they how the creatures of these kingdoms intuitively recognize their own needs their own destiny and fulfill we have no way of knowing how the plant uh, from a standpoint of consciousness functions but as Leonardo da Vinci pointed out the way in which branches come off of the stalk of a plant the various patterns of its leaves and flowers indicate an absolute geometry beyond almost anything we can imagine and all the great canons of art and beauty which man has evolved have arisen from his intuitive receptivity to natural processes so we cannot say that the plant which fulfills its destiny with infinite certainty can be unconscious we do know that it may possess a small measure of objective consciousness that the uh, objective uh, reaction is beginning and that the real abiding inner consciousness of the plant is moving toward involvement or in embodiment and is sensitive sensitively and uh, intuitively and magnetically connected with the body of the plant so that it may administer it and govern it and take care of it now there is a theory or belief about these things uh, that the consciousness of the various groups of the lower kingdoms has not been individualized in other words that one of the reasons for the uh, peculiar uniformity with which we observe in nature a uniformity which however has a delightful uh, expression in diversity that this uniformity this infallible infallible relationship between its consciousness and its form is simply due to the fact that the power of consciousness behind it is not individualized the Paracelsians and other medieval Christian mystics believed in the group spirit theory they held uh, that individualization only takes place uh, when a certain degree of an unfoldment has been achieved and that man is also the lowest species in which individualization of consciousness has been attained thus uh, these other forms of life are under the control and direction of collective intelligences uh, some of these group spirits and uh, similar things undoubtedly were associated with the old concept of the elementals or nature spirits for nature spirits were believed in the old legendary and lore to be industriously engaged in various natural occupations if you read the ancient uh, legends of the Nibelungen or the little dwarfs that lived in the earth or if you have read the rather gentle and gracious story of Undine uh, you realize something of the old legendary 
namely that the elementals were concerned largely with uh, the directing, controlling, and administering of the destinies of non-individualized life. The these elementals, for instance, the gnomes and the earth, had in some mysterious way control over the growth of minerals. And in the uh, Key of Solomon and other magical and cabalistic writings, uh, those who sought for lost treasures in the ground must first win the confidence and respect of the gnomes. For the gnomes can hide these uh, treasures, just as the leprechaun in Irish folklore, if he is properly controlled by man, can lead him to the mysterious pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But these nature spirits were recognized as being in some way necessary. There had to be some explanation for the continuous industry of things. Uh, the infinite organization of bees and the wonderful empire which they created and which Maeterlinck has so wonderfully described. Uh, the story of Solomon and the ants. All these things seem to remind us that even the primitive impulse of empire lies in tiny living things that we can hardly see or study adequately. So the uh, twofold concept moves together. Each nation finding some uh, peculiar way of dressing its symbolism to meet the need of the obvious facts. It was, however, generally assumed that there were controlling powers, that the consciousness tied up uh, with the various uh, levels of bodies uh, had a certain intuitive knowledge of these bodies, but that its consciousness remained awake in itself rather than in its body. Now let's see if we can find some parallels by which we can bring this particular uh, point more clearly uh, to our attention, uh, solve it a little bit for ourselves. We have no direct experience here of uh, being able to disassociate ourselves completely from the body complex. We may be able to do it in sleep to some degree, and by reversing the process, perhaps we can get an idea of what the ancient uh, really understood. Uh, suppose we say, therefore, uh, that the consciousness of, say, a mineral has a kind of sleepness about it. That this consciousness uh, may have a full awareness in its own region, uh, but that it has a dream relationship uh, with this instrument which it is building. Perhaps we can say that in its subjective experience the consciousness of the mineral dreams that it has a body, dreams that this body is growing or unfolding, dreams that it has some beautiful and natural necessity. In dream perhaps the consciousness seems to be associated with that body. Perhaps it can dream itself into believing that it is a mineral. But because it does not have the instrument strongly enough to enter into it, it has only a dreamlike realization of what is happening to that instrument. It is aware but not uh, integrated with it, as in the case of man and his awareness of body. So that uh, the ancients generally held that it is quite conceivable that the spiritual life of the plant, the spiritual life of the animal or the mineral, is just as inevitable as that of man. Uh, that the immortality of the animal is as certain as that of man. But the processes by means of which uh, this growth is accomplished uh, these processes are more advanced in man than in the other kingdoms of nature. This perhaps is why the Buddhists referred to the animals as their little brothers. And St. Francis, with the same insight, had the same reaction 
to the birds and to all the creatures around him. He sensed a comradeship, a unity of life that transcended uh, the differences of appearance. But when we think, as the Buddhist does, of these other kingdom as kingdoms as our younger brethren, uh, then perhaps we, uh, we have some uh, way of understanding them better, inasmuch as assuming ourselves to be adult. These kingdoms are life passing through infancy, childhood, and adolescence before they reach our level, with the mineral as infancy, the plant as childhood, the animal as adolescence. When we do uh, a little study on this situation, we also can then say to ourselves, what else is locked within this earth evolutionary pattern? What more is there to the story uh, than we can even see or sense with our faculties? Are there going to be other kingdoms launched at proper time out of the subjective of the planetary consciousness itself? In all probabilities there are, for the simple reason that uh, the consciousness is infinitely seed producing. Uh, everything is seed life in various stages of the unfoldment of itself. Now if we go into Buddhism, for example, we can create our seven kingdoms in a rather interesting way uh, by this problem of assuming the complete chain, Homer's golden chain, which binds all life together. We can say, in using the Buddhist concept, mineral, plant, animal, man, arhat, bodhisattva, Buddha. In other words, we can have an ascending order of consciousness. That this ascending order of consciousness uh, may or may not uh, be all visible. Uh, the uh, apex of the uh, pattern in Buddhism would be to place man on the fourth level and to declare Buddha, the historical Buddha, to be the example as they did, an example, for they never made it unique, an example of the transcendent possibility of human attainment. This would also then pass uh, the pattern on to the next level of things. The Greeks declared that above man were the heroes, the demigods, and the gods. Um, these, and again, uh, do not sound too much unlike the Buddhist concept. In Northern Buddhism, where the Bodhisattva doctrine was introduced, we would have almost the same idea because we would have the Arhats playing the role of the heroes, and that is exactly what they were in Indian thinking in the old time. The Arhat was the individual who is described as worthy of veneration. This would be the hero. The Greeks venerated their heroes. They venerated Ulysses, and they venerated um, Achilles and others whom they held to be heroes and they declared that after death these heroes were lifted up into the sky to become constellations. The Arhat therefore being the saint worthy of veneration would represent the heroic attainment of self and this more or less further fills in the pattern of his achievement <coughs> in the northern system, the Arhat was not as greatly emphasized uh, as in the southern system, but he did drift into China and Japan later through the Zen philosophy, which was more or less a philosophy of the hero of the world, because the hero self was represented more or less through the achievements of the great Zen teacher, Bodhidharma. In any event, the Arhat is the human being who lives no longer for himself, but
but in the quest of truth and for the service of mankind. <coughs> he is therefore the dedicated one who has transcended, who has renounced the world. He is the Mahatma of uh, the Hindic system. He is the Lohan of China, the Rakan of Japan. Wherever Buddhism exists, he will be found to symbolize the one who has not only transcended worldliness, but by this virtue has achieved strange, magical, mystical powers. He is the individual who we might say has the extrasensory perception range. He is the one who can see at a distance, who can travel through the air, who can ride on dragons, who can do all kinds of weird and wonderful things, some of them very important, some of them symbolically sounding a little silly, but it's all part of an elaborate symbolism. We can't forget the old Ahat, for instance, who made a fountain in his water bowl and went around with a little fountain playing to the top of his water bowl. This hardly changed the course of spiritual history, but at the same time, it is simply an indication of the power to transcend the limitations of material existence. All the Arhats, whether the 16, the 18, or the 500, or the legions that accompanied them, therefore are the heroes of the world. In the East, the hero is the saint. And in the West, the hero takes the Sigurd form. He takes the figure of the champion, the dragon slayer. In the Indian Arhat, the dragon had a toothache. So the Arhat carefully took out the tooth, patted the dragon on its head, and sent it on it back on its way into space to fulfill its proper function. In the West, with that true spirit of our own, the moment Sigurd saw a dragon, he ran a sword through him. This is the difference of our idea of what constitutes heroism. Uh, the West must conquer. Uh, whereas the Oriental is perfectly willing to remove the pain of the dragon and send him on his way. The Arhat gives rise naturally in our thinking uh, to uh, the next step in the northern system, which is the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is called in the Lotus of the Good Law, the young man of good family. The Bodhisattva is the prince in the heavenly kingdom. He is a little like the archangel, Michael especially, but he is also uh, more in the concept of the Grecian secondary circle of divinities. The Greeks had deities, in fact most of their deities have a strangely Buddhist flavor about them, inasmuch as most of the Grecian deities were originally mortals, which is uh, really quite a, a play in the direction of the Buddhist thinking. But the Bodhisattvas represent that Olympian court uh, where uh, on the top of the wonderful mountain Olympus, uh, they gather in magnificent majesty uh, in the uh, Buddhist equivalent in the western paradise of Amitabha. Here is the region above the world where the heroes go when they die, where the good are rewarded, and where great Zeus himself reveals his thunderbolts uh, over a world not too good but not hopelessly bad. Uh, the bodhisattvas, therefore, are the, uh, the, the beings, the demigods and neo-gods that have forms, that seem to have radiant natures and beings. In the East, uh, particularly uh, Japan and China, they are rather more chaste than the Grecian immortals because they are devoted entirely uh, to the great obligation that they cannot find rest for themselves until all living things have attained the enlightenment. But this is not quite as different from other systems as you may think, because actually it is the burden also of the Odinic rites of the Gothic countries. Odin, or the Teutonic Voltan, uh, the old deity with the long beard and one eye and the gray cloak and the great spear with the runes of the law upon its shaft, he went down to the depths of Mimur's well to ask the secret of his own soul. Odin knew 
that a strange destiny was leading him and all the other gods toward that inevitable battlefield of Ragnarok where good and evil perish together. Odin was not a god in the true sense of the word. He was the patriarch. He was the one who managed the world but was himself subject to a power beyond the world, a power which he could not fathom, a power which he perished uh, from because he never was able to grasp its mystery. So the Bodhisattvas uh, are not too different. They remind us, a Kanan particularly, of, in her various aspects reminds us of Brunhild, the mind maiden of Odin. All these legends twine together, but out of them comes the concept of another order of beings above the Arhats. The, the luminous beings in their Samboga bodies. These beings that are never really here, but like the archangels, may even be listed among the saints. They are not regarded as imaginary, although we have never been able to find historical foundation for them. Well, they could be an order of life beyond anything we know. Those beings that Socrates said lived along the shores of the air. And finally, upon their mysterious eternal thrones in endless meditation are the Buddhas, the supreme mysterious powers of the All Fathers, the eternal meditations which bring forth all things. These may also have their parallels and their equivalents in this pattern of the earth, for in the Mahayana system, each of the planets, the Logos of the Greeks, becomes the Buddha of the northern system. Each of the planets is really an embodied Buddha in eternal meditation. From this meditation springs out the whole phenomena of existence, resting as thought in the mind of the meditating sage. His dreams bring forth all the orders of life, and as he awakens from sleep, they retire into himself, and he alone remains. Uh, this system fits very much more closely than you realize into the Western and Grecian theory. There are certain minor adjustments to be made, but the whole picture of the kingdoms will not prove to be essentially different. And in the, of course, in the Buddhist way of life, there being nothing inanimate, there being nothing that does not belong to life itself, we can understand why they bury broken needles with a Buddhist mass, where even flowers have their inalienable rights to exist, where animals are regarded as merely the younger brothers of man and where the invisible bodhisattvas are only elder brothers. In their system, life is bound together by a brotherhood in manifestation and an identity in cause. All things that come into the world in any kingdom of nature come into the realm of suffering. They enter upon the wheel of necessity. Uh, they must pass through the great cycle of the nirdanas or the regions of embodiment. And each thing that does come into the world has some uh, strange fatality to the body which it has fashioned. Even minerals and uh, gems are formed by the agony of the earth. Everything in some mysterious way arises from struggle, from pain and from combustion. Plants pass through the same great cycle on the walls and in the structure of the great sequoia trees, as we study the tree rings, we see how many times great fires ravish this area long before we know of any human beings to dwell here. Fires from lightning, fires from natural combustion, fires in other places from volcanic outbursts. Everywhere, life struggling against the inevitable destinies and even the great tree that may live 5,000, 6,000 years finally falls, 
just as the smallest insect whose life is but for an hour. So in this whole great struggle of necessity, we find all kingdoms bound together by the brotherhood of suffering. The noble mystery, the fourfold secret that all life is suffering. Therefore, in the brotherhood of suffering, life is fitted together into an amazing and wonderful pattern. And in Buddhism, over this world of suffering and all that it contains is the strange, quiet, radiant presence of the Buddha, Sa Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara, Kannan. Infinite compassion behind, controlling, directing. An infinite wisdom behind these things that seem so strange and difficult to understand. And something of infinite purpose being accomplished by all this complexity and all this misery and all this uncertainty which makes up life as we know it. So we think about the kingdoms of nature and all their various habitats and all their various ways of doing things. And we study them more and more and we try to uh, discover certain things that are important about them. One thing we have observed and we do know is that for some reason man of all the kingdoms is the disobeyer. Man is the power which is most likely to exert tyranny over all other things. If man did not have mind or any other kingdom did have it, man would probably not have survived. It is because of the peculiar tyranny of objective enlightenment that he has achieved his survival at the expense of nature. But in the process of, his, of survival, he has offended nature. He has offended the very life that bore him. This offense is not mortal, for man cannot perish. But this offense has complicated his existence and confronts him now with the objective manifestation of his subjective error. So man, becoming in turn a master of all he surveyed, and setting up his own empire, has set it up in with the inadequacy and the fallacy with which he has done everything else in his great journey of growth. So as we look back down through the kingdoms of nature, we observe uh, that the, the whole form of life begins with a strange but infinite faith that life begins as a total acceptance and gradually step by step it evolves into a rebellion. Life begins by some kind of a universal consciousness, a consciousness adequate to all needs and it slowly retracts or uh, in one way or another uh, crystallizes into a highly personal consciousness that is not adequate for its own needs. That therefore this whole great pageantry of man who may have been on this earth they feel now for at least 10 or 15 millions of years from fossilized remains recently discovered. That in this whole problem man has become has been becoming more and more like man but in order to do it he has become less and less like God there has been a strange restriction in him a strange battling in his own nature which is very difficult for us to uh, completely understand he has moved from a very wonderful insight he has moved from from natural habits uh, that were astonishing. Dr. Margaret Mead points out the lingerings of these basic integrities among the primitive anthropological types with which she has concerned herself, particularly in the areas of the South Seas. Uh, we have observed that also out of the past come strange reports as out of a sleep or out of a dream of things. And uh, we may be able to make a kind of parallel again to this in man. Uh, some people, rather nostalgically, have said to themselves, is man ever better than the day he is born? Or does he begin to lose ground immediately? And there's some evidence that he does lose ground. Little by little, 
something about man that is so distinctly and dynamically attractive that all people love babies. They just can hardly help it. It's really a very, very um, unsavory person who doesn't have some instinctive reaction uh, to the infant. Some say that it is because the child is so beautiful. This is, however, probably a parental uh, specialization. Actually, I think it is something of the helplessness of the child that brings out all the helpfulness in man. Perhaps it is also the fact that as the child first begins to live, if it has any opportunity at all to be itself, if it is not psychologically mutilated even in infancy, if the child has a fair chance, uh, I think most mothers will agree that there's something very beautiful in the growth of a child. That it is something that is, that is almost sacred. That watching the character of the child slowly form is one of the most magnificent, inspiring circumstances of life. It is only after this child begins to be over-influenced by conditions around it and perhaps falls prey to worldliness that it begins to lose some of this wonderful, sensitive naturalness. Children do not live just in this world. They live in a wonderful world of imagination, and they also live in a world of wonder. To them, this material world is full of dramatic possibilities. It is full of beauty. It is full of something that lures the child to run out into the forest or run out into the garden and just simply exist as a wonderful living thing. Perhaps this is also the story of the beginnings of life, that the lower forms of nature, as we call them, as, are simply these marvelously attractive things that are wonderful because they are themselves, wonderful because they fulfill, wonderful because there is no pretense and no conspiracy in them. There is something that's very, very much like a child in a beautiful flower. It has in it this magnificent power to fulfill its destiny. And in the mere process of fulfilling its destiny, becomes so beautiful that we regard it as one of the highest ornamentations in all the world. And we have used flowers for happiness, for feasts, for festivals. We have brought them to the uh, sacraments of baptism, and we have carried them also uh, into the last rites of the dead. Always uh, the flower is a thing of beauty, and it is beautiful not only because it is itself, because the wonderful law operating through it, but perhaps like the child it is beautiful because it is uncontaminated by the knowledge or existence of itself. Solomon declared that the king of Israel in all his glory was not arrayed like a lily of the field. That there is something beyond all the ostentation of man in the simple growth of a blade of grass. The Zen monk realizes this. Uh, those wonderful gardens in the temples of the Zenshu and the Tendai and the Hongonji in Japan these beautiful gardens uh, are really little nurseries of living things. Here blades of grass play with little fishes in a pool. There's something of the wonderful paradise of that which is not corrupted. And uh, naturally speaking, this is true throughout the animal kingdom. There are some exceptions. But although even these exceptions exist, we still find the young, even of the animal, to be almost irresistible. Uh, as it gets older, it gets too strong and powerful for us. But as a tiny thing, it is still part of this eternal hopelessness of life. So out of all of this, in a long pattern of things, we seem to see uh, the world sort of growing sad and tired as mind grows up in man. 
we see something that is very beautiful lost. And as we watch the development of nuclear fission, we wonder if this universe might have been happier if evolution had ended with a daisy. I'm not so certain that such would not have been the case. But obviously that was not the purpose. We had to go on. We had to go on to outgrow innocence and come to virtue, but there is a very long, difficult path along the way. Sometime we must go on beyond this, and little by little regain as great objective power, this tremendous subjective power of simplicity, of lack of ostentation, lack of artificiality. The mind that slowly woke up in this world must in a sense go to sleep again in truth. But as it does so, according to both Eastern and Western thinkers, the childish gradually evolves into the childlike. Uh, that which uh, accepted because it did not know finally becomes that which makes the supreme acceptance because it does know. So this evolution was well represented perhaps by the Egyptians as a serpent with a tail in its mouth. It is a thing that ends where its beginning was. And yet in this great cycle of growth, something has been added. And this something seems to be the voluntary decision to accept truth. The plant, the animal, the mineral, even man at his present state, is really unable to make this tremendous voluntary dedication. Man has been given a power to choose, and it is this choice, apparently, that must lead him on to the next level of his own growth in space. The, the door that leads beyond humanity to one of the other orders of life seems to be guarded, and only those that make the great choice of integrity can go beyond man. These other kingdoms grew because of the power of protecting life guiding them. Choice is indwelling life leading man from within its own depths to the next step of his own existence. And uh, we can simply point out that these kingdoms of nature have always had very interesting symbolical meaning. We, we study all the esoteric systems of antiquity, and we can pause for just a moment to consider alchemy, which has a great power in this thing. All your planets, which represent the orbits or levels of psychic development, are involved in the alchemical speculation. The, the alchemical speculation deals with a recapitulation of the power of growth through the four kingdoms. In other words, it begins with the mineral. And in the retort, the mineral passes to the plant. The plant becomes an animal. The animal becomes a man. And man is transformed into a mysterious crystal being called the homunculus. And this crystal being, of course, is the adapter our hat self. But the alchemical process, as described, shows the entire evolution of energy, an evolution arising uh, constantly within the mysterious retort or alembic of the Earth's atmosphere. All this procedure takes place within the auric field of the planet, and this auric field finally produces within itself uh, the unfolding powers uh, of, we might almost say, planetary deities. Apparently, the end of the evolutionary cycle is that seven vital centers within the planetary power, by this process of evolution, by this growing up and releasing themselves through the powers uh, of the uh, seven kingdoms. This wave of specialized life 
<coughs> ultimately obtains identity in consciousness with the planet which formed it or carried it or sustained it through its evolutionary process. When these waves of evolution become identical with planetary centers, then according to the Eastern system, when the time comes and the planet itself goes into rest or sleep between days of manifestation, the planet having achieved this degree of growth as a total being, the seven powers, seven rays, seven suns of the planet, having unfolded themselves and returned to identity with it, the planet then becomes a sun. It becomes a luminous center. For this evolutionary process causes the, a great uh, store of psychic energy to be added to the core of a planet. When this is accomplished, then the planet becomes a sun. When this happens, then these seven suns of the earth, representing the seven orders of life evolving here, become the planets of the next order of life and reveal their races, their orders, their species, and their types through the release of the seed lives within themselves. Thus the evolutionary process goes on and on, each thing gradually becoming a self-center of spiritual radiance. Each of the mysterious powers returning again to the source of themselves. But when they return, reinforced by their cycle through the different layers and natures of the planetary power, uh, they return rich with energy, rich with power, and returning into the sort of nirvanic suspension of the planet, they transform this core from a planet to a sun. They have sustained or supported this energy, which has become increased through its revelation through the orders of life. And when the energy reaches a certain degree of radiance through the structures it has built, it becomes a solar energy. The solar systems in turn have their same relationship to cosmic systems, and so on and on. Nor must we forget for a moment that we are a comparatively high sta stage in this on and onness of things. Uh, below us and beneath us is a concatenation or a great chain of solar systems. Systems infinitely less than our own. But solar systems which as far as the elements of themselves are concerned, we have no way of knowing what their consciousness may be. It may be that thousands of these solar systems could balance on the head of an ordinary pin. But we are not in any way sure that they are essentially different or that they are any more lacking in internal consciousness than we are. We do not know what this consciousness is. We do not know how to estimate anything that is less than ourselves. We can simply turn right into our own bodies to demonstrate this. There are countless solar systems under the flesh of man. There are magnificent structures almost identically resembling solar systems in the marrow of bone. There are infinite orders of life living out their destinies in us. We have our minerals, our plants, our animals, and our humanity uh, crowning this entire pattern. And to these lesser kingdoms, we are as man to these lesser kingdoms around us. And perhaps in the larger pattern of things, we are as gods to other orders of life under our own skins. These forms of life have no, no recourse against our whims. They have no way of protecting themselves against our inconsistencies or our intemperances. But we are presiding over a magnificent complex universe. Perhaps there are within man more tiny spots of cosmic light than we can see in the Milky Way. Now what are the consciousness factors of all this? 
To us, we can't even realize that these things exist as living things. We may examine them in a small cross-section or a smear on a microscope slide, but we have no conception of this. We do not know the hope or the fear or the pain within ourselves of these little lives. We do not know how many minute organisms that we cannot even imagine might be raising their hands, clasped in prayer, asking us for mercy. We don't even know. From a standpoint of physical thinking, we probably don't even believe that these little cells have any life. But what do we know? For if they are alive, and they have to be, they are in some way tiny uh, manifestations of total life. And if one of the most minute of these little particles was actually to cease, it is reasonable to suspect that the entire universe would perish. They can change, they can be modified by fission and other things, but if one unit of life died, then all things would die. Nothing dies, everything changes. Everything moves from one arrangement and one pattern to another, passing through different levels of consciousness. But what races, what orders, what incredible hierarchies may be in this minute world behind and below us in our evolution? From what almost inconceivable distances have we traveled? What part of our intuition, our psychic faculty, our internal sense has been mellowed and matured by this journey? If we have come an infinite distance to even reach what we are now, what infinite distance must we still travel? Where is the beginning and the end of this great program of growth? And how can we even contemplate it without the transcendent admiration for the inconceivable magnitude of the wisdom that sustains it. How can we doubt for a moment that this entire pattern is the manifestation of an infinite, inconceivable reality, and that this reality, perhaps, is the sovereign God we have been seeking, a God not an irritable old gentleman, but a God that is manifesting forever through an infinitude of worlds, through things so great and so small that they stagger us. They leave us absolutely incapable of thinking through this pattern of our own life. Yet we are here, and we came from somewhere, and into our very bodies are thrown these cells, these structures, these molecules that have also had an eternal existence dancing in some sunbeam of eternity. We are fashioned out of the a gathering of infinite life itself. We are moving with that life. We are gradually striving to understand it. We are also looking for that time when in perfect insight we can give ourselves back again to the infinite wisdom of that life. It is all a very interesting and wonderful and dramatic story. And while we may not be able to remember all the parts, and probably there's no reason why we should, still perhaps it will give us just a little more of a fourth dimensional qualitative look at things, which can be important, can be useful in our daily living. Well, I guess that's all for tonight, folks.